Welcome to the Women's Sanctuary, the podcast about tending the soul of women, sisterhood, and the rise of the sacred feminine. I'm your host, Arlia Hoffman. Hello, and welcome to the Women's Sanctuary. I'm Arlia Hoffman. We begin this season with an interview with Katherine Elberfeld. I will introduce her in a moment, but I have to say this was one of the most magical conversations I've had on this podcast. We begin with talking about her life story, um, her call to the ministry, and her experiences of sexual harassment in the ministry, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. I was raised um, as the child of a minister, and within the context of the church, I witnessed a lot of sexual harassment. And so she is very vulnerable in her sharing about her experiences And I just uh, so admire her honesty. And then we begin talking about the nature of God, uh, the feminine aspect of God, the incomprehensible nature of God, and the, the love that one can experience with the divine that is beyond words. What I love about my conversation with Catherine is that she's coming from a Christian perspective and saying all the same things that I talk about in the Women's Sanctuary. And now a word about Catherine. Her career in journalism, freelance writing, and the Episcopal priesthood inform and inspire her writing. As the founder of the Gabriel Center for Servant Leadership, she published To Speak of Love and In the Midst of Sunflowers. Her articles on servant leadership have appeared in regional and international publications. Her published works also include the short story collection Make Yourselves at Home and the novel The Lady of the House. Forward Movement published Jordan to Jerusalem, a book of meditations for the season of Lent. Other short stories have appeared in Appalachian Heritage, the literary magazine of Berea College, Berea, Kentucky. Katie is also an experienced facilitator in the applied human behavioral sciences and is an accomplished dynamic public speaker. Katie holds a bachelor's degree in English from the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee, a master's degree in communication from the American University, and a master's in divinity from the Virginia Theological Seminary. Katie is passionate about reading, hiking, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, pickleball, and music, and she stubbornly remains a far-side aficionado. A native of Georgia, she now lives in Marietta. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. I appreciate this opportunity. Absolutely. I, I, I've been looking forward to this. Because, because the Women's Sanctuary podcast is really all about women's journeys, about how they got to where they, they are in life. Um, I've always been fascinated that you and I had a similar um, early life uh, relationship story, mm-hmm. um, and then, and both are in some form of ministry, both doing leadership development. Tell me how, um, what that journey was like for you as a, and how you got to where you are now. <laughs> okay, in sixty seconds, right? <laughs> yes, as I, as I said to some, someone recently. So, how'd you get here? So tell me how you got here. <laughs> I took a cab. <laughs> or your famous Uber. I took, I took, I took, I, I took an Uber. Um, well, as I look back on it now, I can see that, uh, God was calling me to the priesthood. Um, I think my first, my first memory is, uh, when I was a child, we were on a vacation. I was, we were visiting some church, it wasn't for a church service, but it was 
we were touring the church and I remember having this really special feeling about that environment. And, um, when I was in my own church at home, when growing up, I would see the rector doing, you know, this, that, or the other. And I would wonder if I would like to be a rector. Now, of course, that was way before the Episcopal Church uh, deigned to ordain women. Um, but my my reaction to that thought was, I don't want to spend all day, every day, uh, mediating arguments between the flower guild and the altar guild and the organist, you know, it just didn't, it didn't uh, provide me with any energy whatsoever. Yeah. So then um, when I was, uh, you know, I was married to an Episcopal priest and um, the, the feeling and the, the call came back and Richard and I talked about it and, and I was thinking I was called to be a deacon, and he was very supportive of that. By that time, women were being ordained. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't act on it because I um, I had three ministries. I was starting my family with my children. Um, I was a clergy spouse, which I considered to be a ministry, in which, and I just loved that. A lot of people don't, but I just loved it. And then with my writing. So I figured I was ministried up and didn't need to add anything more. Then um, after the divorce, actually we were separated in 1988. And the kids and I at that point lived in Lexington, Kentucky. And they weren't with me. I went to, we, we went to church at the cathedral in Lexington. And I went by myself that day. And I was just standing in the pew, minding my own business. I had already, by that time, I had already um, gotten accepted into Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria to pursue a Master of Theological Studies and with the idea that I would then be ordained a deacon. So all that was all set, I thought. And I was just standing there. And all of a sudden, it was it was as if God just grabbed me and dragged me from the place where the deacons are to where the priests are and made it very clear that that's what God had in mind. And I remember just standing there resigned that mm-hmm. I had spent 40 years, hard-earned years, resisting the call. And then there it was in a way that I couldn't, I couldn't deny it anymore. I didn't feel, go ahead. That feeling feels really familiar. I know that feeling of like, oh my gosh. Okay. This is it. I'm going to do this. Okay. Fine. (laughs) Okay. Fine. (laughs) Well, you were faster than I was because I knew I still had the feeling that I didn't have to say yes. It was just that God was making clear what God wanted. And so I did resist it for three more days. And I looked at myself in the mirror and cried and said, I don't want to be a priest. Da, 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 da. And after three days, I said, yes. And then it was as if all of the gifts and resources that God had given me were then flowing in the same direction in a current. That's beautiful. Yeah. So um, to the level that you're comfortable, tell me about your divorce. Was it connected to your calling? No, I don't okay. know. It was different. Yeah. Um, there were just, I'm very big on the, um, expression and reception of affection and, and intimacy. And, um, there were so many things I loved about Richard still love about him. That was not something he could meet me on. Yeah. So it was just a mismatch. Yeah. 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 And we're great. We're great buddies now. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. You know, I, it's funny that was um, in, in my situation, I was, I was hoping it could be that way. Sometimes you just never know, you know, sometimes right. things work out that way and sometimes they don't, but um, yeah. it's taken us a long time, but, mm-hmm. but we're there. So um, you reluctantly said, yes, yes. 
And when I called my mother, it was so funny because I told her that I was discerning that I was being called to the priesthood. And her first word was, yikes. (laughs) (laughs) And then she said, well, if that's what God wants, then God will help you make it happen. Was she worried for you? No, it's just, it was just uh, like we already knew, uh, you know, to a large extent what this life was like because of being married to Richard for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, I just thought it was hilarious, but she she wasn't (laughs) worried. It was just like, okay. (laughs) <laughs> and and so what was that experience like um training and studying to become a priest i really had looked forward to it i had chosen to be at home with my children and um uh, i was i felt so blessed that i could continue with my writing so i could continue with my career and be with them at the same time And my younger son was getting ready to go into the first grade when I was, when I was starting seminary. So, um, and then my older son was, um, in middle school. So it was a good time for me to make this shift. And Mm -hmm. I was really looking forward to adult companionship and conversations in the refectory over lunch about all kinds of, you know, mind stretching, spiritual stretching things. And that just, that just wasn't the case. I was very disappointed in the seminary environment. Uh, It was extremely conservative for one thing. Um, Didn't offer any, 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 any courses in women's studies. Mm. I had to, I, but I was able to get that through the consortium of other seminaries in DC that we were part of. Um, and the, uh, passive aggressive behavior, um, among the seminarians was just, um, enough to gag on. Um, and I think it all came from fear. Um, I was very confident in my relationship with my bishop. And so I wasn't fearful, um, because I knew that he, he was, um, all about this pursuit. Um, but, uh, I found that people, what they said and did was completely different from what mm-hmm. was going on underground. And, um, so I, you know, people talk about their friendships that they made in seminary that they still have, blah, blah, blah. And, um, it just didn't do it for me. So is that because it was a competitive environment and they just had to look and they felt compelled to look and be the best and without fault. Yeah. I think that's yeah. part of it. Like what if the bishop hears this about me, then will he is all he's would he then, you know, move to have me kicked out of the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a lot of focus on grades and um, I was flabbergasted about that too. Cause I thought we were adults and, could maybe have a different focus. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was just, I just felt as if I were in a completely different place from most everybody there. It was lonely. Yeah. So how did you feel coming out of that? I mean, did you feel prepared? Yes. Um, And as the years have gone on, because I've been ordained now as a priest for almost 26 years, and as I look back at it, there's no place other than Virginia where I would have wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Um, the training I got there was um, at the top, at the top. And beyond what I've seen, uh, you know, in any profession, you're around colleagues who were trained by different, you know, uh, trained in different schools and all that kind of thing. And I always feel that I got the best, the very best training. That's great. So I couldn't even, I didn't even want to drive by the seminary for years after I graduated. But, um, you know, just was, it's just, it's almost like an open wound that it's Mm -hmm. still not, when I get the magazine from them, you know, that goes straight into recycling. You know, I can hardly stand to handle it. It's, um, 
it was a hard time. And so which, which, which been your experience as a priest in the Episcopal church since then as a female priest? <laughs> oh yes. Well, I discovered that once I put one big toe on the seminary campus, I started to be the subject of um, sexual harassment, and um, that continued there. Um, And then as I got ordained and was dealing with colleagues, clergy colleagues, um, the sexual harassment, verbal abuse continued. And I was never like thrown up against the wall. Um, like that, but it was like a constant, constant erosion. You know, the the un the unwelcome, uninvited hand on the shoulder, the um, the jokes that were super um, inappropriate, um, body language, body language, big time, mm-hmm. um, and it never really ceased until I left parish ministry, set it to the side, set, put parish ministry to the side and established the the servant leader center. There, that was a healthy, a healthy environment because we deliberately set out to create a healthy environment. Well, I was about to say a healthy environment because you, you were able to create it and establish that. Yeah. 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 And so it was, it was like, Ooh, this, all this icky stuff is, it's been happening and here, Oh, it's not happening anymore. <laughs> Ain't that something? Yeah. This, and this might be an obvious question, but did you feel like you had any recourse or any ability to, to say anything? I mean, I think most women say, you know, don't feel that way. I didn't. I remember um, in the second parish where I was, the rector was horrendously verbally abusive of me and he, he also um, committed some of the most grievous uh, sexual, sexual, um, uh, what word do I use? I guess, I guess I'll use the word assault. I mean, it feels like an assault, even though he wasn't touching me. It was, mm-hmm. you know, from things he would say. Um, and my older son, Mark, whom you know very well and work with now, he um he must have been like a senior in high school at that point, and he said, "Why don't you just say to him, hands off?" And I said that the reason I didn't was because I already felt, you know, I was already inferior to him in the hierarchy, and I already felt v- vulnerable in that way, and I didn't want to give him anything more to work with. So yeah. right or wrong, that was, you know. But we have him to thank for the Servant Leader Center because through that experience, I was like, this ain't, this ain't working for me. So <laughs> how did you, how did you deal with that within your own self? Um, boy, I hated it. I just hated it. Um, I think it was just, you know, then I, that I was just not going to let him know that it bothered me. I think that's, um, and I do believe that the parish administrator there, who was a former Navy naval officer and um, is now an, is now an Episcopal priest, I think she told him to stop it because mm-hmm. it was like all this was happening on a say a Tuesday. And on Wednesday, it stopped. And then that's where his verbal abuse started. And, Mm -hmm. you know, he had me in tears on my birthday because of the way he treated me between the services. And I was celebrating. And I cried all the way through the service. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized that that was, there were two times when I said goodbye to the institution of the church, and that was the second time. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, I, I'm also curious about um, how you healed internally. Like what, what supported you through that or helped you deal with it? I think that's a great question. Great question. I don't know that I've ever asked myself that in that, in those words. I would say that by God very gently calling me to establish a center where people would be paid to get out of bed every day and work on educating people about servant leadership, training people in how to be a servant leader. Because as you very well know, this is totally countercultural and yeah. it takes all the energy you've got to push that boulder up the hill. Right. And I think that God, by leading me, you know, and Camus has a, he has a, there's a quote from Camus in which he says that often the greatest ideas come gently like the wings of a dove. And that's how that was. It, it was not, you know, the sledgehammer on the head. It was a very gentle unfolding. And um, I think that's, I mean, that's what contributed to my healing was to yeah. get on a different path because the institution of the church and I are just allergic to each other. <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Break out in a rash. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, just get out before the sheriff, you know, get out of the city limits before the sheriff catches up with you. <laughs> yeah. You and I agree on that. Yeah. So is it, is it that the, Am I hearing you right that the movement towards servant leadership was really this reaction to the attitudes and the behaviors you were seeing in the institution of the church? Actually, I'd been very blessed to be um, to to already have that foundation. Um, the first mention I heard of that that way of being was uh, my bishop. Don Wimberly, whom I've known him for about 36 years and love him with all my heart. He was preaching a sermon back, back in Lexington and mentioned servanthood ministry. And this was before I was aware of my calling, I believe. And I, I just sort of lit up, you know, mm -hmm. it just, and um, I can still see him there doing that, saying that. And then when I got into my first job after seminary, the rector was involved with and had been for a long time with groups that trained people in how to live out servant leadership. And he got me in, you know, he said, there's this program. Would you like to be part of it? And I said, you know, when do I, where do I sign up? And so I'd had that foundation since 1993, and I was working for this other guy. Uh, what I've said through the years is I worked with the first rector, and I worked for the second rector. Mm -hmm. And so then with the second rector, um, I started there in 97 and left um, in the summer of 98. So I was there for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And because I had this grounding of servant leadership, I saw his behavior. I saw the behavior. I saw the complicit um, contributions, you know, from the lay people. I've often said if there had been 10,000 lay people saying, well, this is not healthy, let's change it. I would have had no need to change locations yeah uh, but to me it gave me an opportunity to see that it was systemat systemic systemic mm -hmm. and i couldn't i wasn't going to go backwards i wasn't going to unknow what i knew and i couldn't go this to the side and i couldn't go to the other side mm -hmm. so the only way forward was into the void that's a good way to put it mm-hmm mm -hmm. does that sound mm-hmm because it's a sick, it's a, it's like, like many institutions. It's a, to me, it's a, well, to me, the, the, it's, to me, it's like Boy Scouts in that I was a Girl Scout and I was, I treasured my scouting days. And I, when I'm in the woods, I still follow what I learned. 
as a scout. My, Mark, my older son, was an Eagle Scout. Six years later, my younger son, Nathaniel, was in Scouts. And he, it just wasn't working, you know. And it's, it's not what the Scouts teach. It's the institution and the way it's set up is so archaic. And he just thought it was, you know, a lot of it, again, not the content, but the trappings were dorky. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't wear his uniform to school. And so we got him to first, whatever that's called, first class or something. Then we said, hey, we've, we've, we've done what we set out to do. <laughs> and to me, the, the, the way the church operates and manifests itself in terms of the services and all of that, I just think, I believe that it's already died, that it's not dying, that it has died. You said that to me sometime in the last three or four years, and I thought, that is spot on. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? They're they're dead, and they don't know it yet. Exactly. And I really feel that the most wonderful thing we could do would be to have a celebration of life. You know, like when I die, I'm hoping. Should we cremate them? (laughs) Cremate a couple of buildings. Uh, Really. But just, you know, thank God for for what it gave us all. I mean, it, it nourished me. It fed me. It informed me. It held me in its bosom, you know, all my life until I went to seminary. (laughs) And, um, and then I believe that God's trying to do more for us than we even, than we're allowing God to do, which is typical from, for me anyway, Mm -hmm. Um, I believe God is, is calling us into a new age and it's not God. I don't believe that the belief in God is dead. I think that's stronger than ever, but it's the packaging Mm -hmm. that we, we need to bury it, celebrate it, and then allow God to show us how to do it now. I I think a lot of people would agree with you. What, what do you imagine that new packaging to look like? Well, one piece I think would be to go back to the early church model of home churches. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, as you know, interestingly enough, a lot of the patrons and the leaders of the home churches were women. So, and I think the guys just sort of usurped that leadership um, and took it over about, 2000 years ago. Um, 2000 and let's say 2008, 19 years ago. (laughs) And six months. Um, So I think that would be one thing. I think, you know, to move away from the, from the hierarchy Mm -hmm. uh, has, is just fundamental to the changes that need to take place. Um, I would like to see lay people um, lead services, you know, preach. Mm -hmm. um, And if you, if you're going to have a person lead the Eucharist, fine, but let's all of us, let's say the Eucharistic prayers together. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in fact, that, training that you get about the the priest saying the Eucharistic prayer is that the priest is saying it for everybody. Well, then why not have everybody say it out loud? Yeah. I mean, I think that's really lame myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you also have um, your own thoughts about Christ and Mm -hmm. who Christ is. Say more about that. Well, as I go along, I'm learning just how mighty God is and persistent. Um, and then with Jesus, you know, I really feel that so much of what we do, like we were just talking about with the structure of the church, that's so, um, it's an anathema to what Jesus taught us. And and to me, that's just, I'm just 
broken hearted about that, that Jesus would come here, um, would put up with, you know, would put up with all the, um, you know, the, the evil that he encountered, whether it was the Philistine, uh, the Philistines, the Pharisees, the, uh, yeah, that P word, <laughs> the Pharisee, <laughs> <laughs> the Pharisees telling him that he couldn't do this or he couldn't do that. Uh, conspiring against him, his own, you know, going through the betrayal and abandonment of his friends, um, and on and on and on. It breaks my heart that that he would stand for and bring to bring to us this vision of a land and an environment and a way of being that that um, includes every single person and every single person is equal. Mm -hmm. And that literally I said this to a friend of mine who, who is a, who has a PhD in the, in new Testament studies. And I said, you know, Bill, I think like five minutes after Jesus ascended into heaven, the men got together and they said, okay, you can only have the Eucharist, you don't, you have to have the Eucharist once a week and only we can give it to you. And he said, Katie, you're not that far off. Mm-hmm. So the, the, you know, the, um, the gap, the chasm between what Jesus taught, which is not complicated. You know, people say, I don't know what God's will is. I don't know what the mind of Jesus is. Yeah, we do. I mean, who was more vulnerable than Jesus, right? And um, the ga- the chasm between that and what we do is heartbreaking. It's like the minute the minute he ascended into heaven, we just went right back to what we were doing beforehand. Yeah, and at that cost, um, you want to talk about Krista now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. Krista is a piece of uh, sculpture that I have. I actually have two of them. And they depict a Christ in the female form on a cross. So you have the head bent, you have the arms outstretched, you have the, the, um, uh, the feet, um, kind of similar to the feet like you see with um, uh, a crucifix. Mm-hmm. And um, when I came upon this, visiting some friends in Missouri who were both artists, um, this piece was on their coffee table in front of their sofa. And I just looked down at it and had this big explosion flash going on in my head. And it was as if, it and I were, we'd been meant to be together for my whole life. And then there we were. And uh, I asked them if it were, if she were for sale and they said, yes. So I bought it and we packed it up and I brought it home. But she's, uh, it's an amazing piece because as I say, she's, it's the crucifix with a female form. And he, he called it Krista. And then later I commissioned him to make another one for me. And he said one of the neat things was that when he had the idea to create her afterwards, he learned that some people in New York were also doing the same thing and calling it Krista. So Mm -hmm. it was really very cool. I thought that the Holy Spirit was working in more more places than one. Imagine that. (laughs) Imagine how that works. So I just think that that really, for me, it it shows the incorporation in Christ of the suffering of women, uh, the feminine aspect of the Godhead. Um, and in this one, in this, in the first one that I bought, the colors are pink and blue and they're dot, mm-hmm. they're dots and they're not really connected. And, and the artist said that that was to show the, the static, between men and women. 
And so that Very that's profound. A, yeah, that's a place I, I want to talk more about is I would imagine it's it was rather revolutionary for you to, at least in yourself, whether you brought it forward to the parishioners or not, but to hold this idea of the feminine in mm-hmm. existing also in the in in the form of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really central to my understanding of the Godhead. I, I've never read, um, the color purple, but I have read a quote that apparently CC says in it. When I learned that God was white and a male, I lost interest. <laughs> I don't think she's alone there. <laughs> I don't think she is. I think she's got some company. Um, and I, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's not just about, well, I don't want to feel left out, you know, that I'm a woman and God's only interested in masculinity. Um, but it, it, to me, again, it, there's heartache because it's like, we're trying to narrow God. And so what I would say to parishioners is that, you know, it's both and. It's mm-hmm. both and, 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 and um, that God incorporates the mas- masculinity, femininity, and more. Yeah, in in my reading, and I'm not an expert, but in the in Gnosticism, they say it's the Christus Sophia. Oh, it yeah. Is, it is the Christ and the feminine form of God, which is the wisdom, the Sophia, exactly. Christus Sophia. Um, exactly. That, that has a lot of meaning and resonance for me. Me too. In, in fact, I forgot to mention this to you the other day, but um, give a shout out to the Sophia Institute in Charleston, South Carolina, who do a lot of work, um, bring a lot of good quality content to Charleston and, and the Southeast and now virtually um, with a lot of great spiritual content. And I was there years ago and they had a, and forgive me, I don't remember the artist's name, but they had a, um, they were selling posters of a black Madonna on yeah. the, yeah. on the, on the cross, um, because this artist had dreamt this. And so this, this poster was all his dream images. And so it's her mm. and there are pomegranates Aww. and, and there are, Aww. the other thing that drew me to this is there are forms on the poster that look like feminine earth forms is the best way I can say it. Like it looks like a plant, but it looks like a feminine. Sure. Body. Sure. And what amazed me was that I'm also very interested in ancient Minoan art, which was the pre Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Matriarchal culture. Yep. And a lot of their art looks exactly the same way. They have oh, these gosh. like, um, Almost like bell shaped yep. plants with sprouts coming out of them. They look very feminine, but you can't place them as any particular plant. And I just looked at that and I was like, Krista Sophia, right yeah. there. Yeah. Right That's there. Right. And I I left the church almost twenty years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, for some of those very same reasons. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, in a different way, I felt quite alone, did mm-hmm. not feel the sense of community, mm-hmm. and also this very, very narrow mindedness about what or who God is. Right. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons I do this work today is that God is so much bigger than we can ever even comprehend. Exactly. Why, why would we ever attempt to put God in? Not just a box, but <laughs> this box that's about the size of our pinky. And, and God's pill like, box. you can try, but that's not going to work. I don't fit in that pill box. Well, and that's what I've said over and over again to parishioners and and friends and anybody who whom I can uh, nail down for two seconds <laughs> is, uh, you know, I don't want that to me, that's excellent news. I don't want a God that will fit in my brain or in my head because that God would be too limited. You know, I want this, like with the Trinity, people struggle with trying to understand it. Well, 
isn't it kind of cool that we can't totally grasp that? I agree. You know? And that's one of the reasons, even though I still really have this strong connection to and relationship with the, with the person of Jesus, I nonetheless, my term for God has become the universe. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. for me, that at least gives my brain the sense of expansiveness that I can't even comprehend what this force is right. that, that lives me. Yeah, that I I live out, and so, um, yeah, I, I love, I love that you know, you're in your work or in, in your own mind, you you are both Episcopal and a priest, and acknowledging, and it's kind of sad. That, <laughs> I mean, that there aren't that many people, but you included acknowledge the vastness and the incomprehensibility, comprehensibility. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of of God. Yeah. 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 Okay, well that's a wrap. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm like, where do you go from there? <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank sharing you. that. That's um you know, that's that's one of the things that resonates for me the most is just it. It, it it gets to the point where you don't even have words for right. to describe how that experience is, but um, yeah. But I think that's probably how it should be, as you said. Exactly, exactly. So see, that's scary. I mean, I remember um, our one of our bishops in uh, Virginia preached uh, I at the church where I had all those challenges. He um, it may have been Palm Sunday. It might have even been Easter Day. I can't remember. But he, I remember he said, the reason those pews are bolted to the floor is because it's an attempt to keep the Holy Spirit from doing what the Holy Spirit wants to do. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. That kind of blows my mind. I loved it. I just loved it. Because if if they weren't bolted to the floor, then what might happen? But see, we don't want that. Can't have we, that. <laughs> no. We don't, that's, you know, I mean, it's funny how when we talk like this, everything seems to be connected. Um, but that's, You know, there's been a fear of the feminine from, you know, gosh, I don't know. I don't know if it was from prehistoric time or when it started, but there's this fear of the feminine that we're, you know, the feminine is considered to be unpredictable and might take you to this place or that place that's scary and all that kind of thing. And uh, hysterical, right? Yes. Yes. Um, uterus hysterical yes. and um, and I think that that's a part of the Godhead that is scary to a lot of us because when we truly let the Holy Spirit take over we truly do not know uh, where we're going to land yeah I mean it is scary and it can't be controlled. It can't be controlled. And so what is our re- our response? Our response is to try at every turn to control it. To bolt that pew to the floor. Bolt that pew bolt to that. the floor. Yeah. That's, that's incredible because that's the very, that's the very nature of my work is to yeah. help people become more comfortable in the unknown and in the void and in the feminine where, yeah, it's, it's the womb of creation. That's right. That's right. Go back home. That's where it's all born. Mm-hmm. Is in that n- unknowingness. And and uh, speaking of the pews, um, I'd love to share a little story with you that, <laughs> it, to me, is one of the most remarkable stories I've ever heard. Um, when Richard and I. Mark lived in Missouri. Mark was 
about three or so, um, there was a priest from Corpus Christi, Texas, who was in our little town, and he he um, was talking to Richard about joining him at his church in Corpus Christi. So I remember we were sitting in our living room, and Sam was this great, big, huge, huge guy. And uh, he told us this story about being at a little bitty church, probably somewhere in Texas. And um, this new couple <laughs> came in and sat down at the front of the church. And, and these were, um, yeah, these were pews, sat down the, in the, at the front. And then this ancient woman who always sat where these people were, went up the aisle and made a move, made a move so she could sit in her spot. I mean, it's like you have the George Washington plaque. This is where George Washington sat. And Sam got into the pulpit and he told us that he said to them, that's the last goddamn time that's going to happen. Oh my goodness. (laughs) And I want all the vestry after church to go home, get your trucks, get your wrenches, come back and they removed all they removed all the pews wow. and took them off and replaced them with chairs. Oh my goodness. Good for him. I know. And he could get by with it mm-hmm. because of his size and because he was a man, he could stand up in that pew. I mean, in that pew in that pulpit and say, that's not going to happen again. Yeah. And that awesome. That is amazing. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Love that. Well, I want to shift gears because okay. we we're 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 missing one of the legs of Katie's life uh, of, of this three legged stool, and mm-hmm. that is your writing. So mm-hmm. apparently, that's been. I didn't realize how long you've been writing, but you're a maybe your whole life. Tell me, yeah. tell me about that and what you're working on. Um, I've been writing since I was about five. My first publication was uh, called Made Up Stories. By Katie Folkley, yeah. and uh, I still have two or three copies of of that. Mother helped me. Um, I don't remember how we, if we mimeographed the stories or how we duplicated them, but I can remember putting them together with her, and um, there. There, the covers are construction paper, and then you have the little brass, um, brads, brads, yes, and made up, sto- made up stories. And I gave them to my friends, and um, you know, people will still talk to me about those stories, which is fun. Um, my great grandfather, grandfather, dad were all in the newspaper business, so I've often said that. Blood doesn't run in our veins. Ink does. And now <laughs> my son Mark is writing. So he's fifth generation. Um, and uh, I studied um, writing in college. And then um, daddy recommended that I get a degree in journalism because he said that would trim the fat off the writing and so I did get a master's degree in communication from American University in D.C., which I just adored, 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 adored. And uh, worked as a, a reporter on newspaper staffs and uh, freelanced um, until I went to seminary. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the first book that I, other than made up stories, the first book that I had published was in 1979. I don't think it's in print anymore. It's called Jordan to Jerusalem. And it was published by forward movement, which is an Episcopal publishing house. And it was an S it was a meditation for every day in Lent, starting with um, Ash Wednesday and going through Palm Sunday. They didn't want me to do Holy week. Um, and then I've written two books on servant leadership, different aspects of that and a novel and 
a collection of short stories, and I'm working on another novel now, which I'm having a lot of fun with. Well, let's talk about let's talk about that current novel. Okay, what's it about? Well, the title is a, "An Umbrella Made for a Man," <laughs> and it has to do with a uh, little girl who, um, and as she's growing up, she's looking for love and security and her family of origin. And finding it in some places and not finding it in others. Um, and how she struggles with that, struggles with um, the verbal abuse that occurs in her household. Um, and then she becomes an Episcopal priest and she endures the the um, sexual harassment that and verbal abuse that we've been talking about. And uh, then at the same time, you know, at, she's been divorced. She, she goes through a divorce and is is single for many, many years and dates everybody in the Western Hemisphere, you know, and can't find love there either. Um, so it's her. So you follow you you um, you get you get little flashes or little vignettes or. Um, snapshots of life as a child as a young and then as an adult with a career and looking for a relationship and so it's really her search for love and then she does come out uh at the end uh largely through dreams god helps her to see that once love is there it's there to stay it it doesn't leave mm. it's in, it stays intact and then that that gives her so much joy and so much relief to know that because she never had known that before and to know that and to realize that uh then she's like good to go you know from from there and then she can see what happens later but that's that's i think that's about as far as the book is going to take her take her is to say okay now i see that and um the catalyst for that epiphany was um when she was in seminary she and a classmate loved each other very much and they decided that they couldn't pursue their relationship because of being in that environment mm -hmm. And um, then he ended up marrying somebody else, which broke her heart into about a billion pieces. And that was another open wound. You know, it's just like every she went she went on without thinking about him, and then if she would think about him, it was like she was being rejected all over again. Mm. And then God helped her to see, no, that their their love was still there. It was still right there. Um, that it hadn't gone anywhere. It was still there. And it was just this, you know, glorious, incredible um, revelation. Mm -hmm. And as, as I said, a, a lot of that came through dreams. A lot of that understanding. Through the characters' dreams or your dreams? Both. My dreams and then I fictionalized them and put them in the book. Yeah. And and you've been writing during the, we're talking in December 2020, so you've been writing all this year. Has the pandemic affected your ability to write or enhanced it? Or It's enhanced it. Um, you know, having this, having this time... I'm very blessed in that I don't have to be at work outside the home and I have lovely places in which to work at home. Uh, so I'm very, I'm aware of as to how blessed I am with my circumstances and uh, being retired and all of that. So I just figured this was a really good time to get going on this. And it's been kind of a, dovetailed um, 
process in that I didn't know the book was going to take take me to this place or take Irene, the protagonist, to this place. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, as the revelations came to me, then then I incorporated them into the book. And uh, when I say I fictionalized the dreams, I actually have recorded the dreams as they came to me, but I've had mm-hmm. Irene have them as opposed to me. Have them. Right. Um, so it's, and I think that also by having this time that's been um, cleaner, you know, we, we aren't in the grocery store every five seconds or we, uh, I'm not playing pickleball temporarily until this gets behind us. Um, so there's more space to receive mm-hmm. what God wants to sh- tell us. And so it's, yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because my business partner and I were just discussing creativity the other day hey. and about how, <laughs> about how, you know, the creativity requires that spaciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And the some amount of silence to be able to be heard and Mm -hmm. flourish. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, And this spring and summer winter have been so incredibly beautiful. Um, And a large part of that is because there's not, there aren't so many noxious fumes going into the air that being immersed in the beautiful natural world these last several months has yeah. Been very nourishing as well. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And been good for the earth. And been, yeah, been good for the earth. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, you know, and you were talking earlier about not having words f- for Christ. And since I've been given this knowledge that, um, that because I've I would say I've really loved twice and once was Richard and once was this guy and I can see now that I still love Richard mm-hmm. um and I still love this guy and he and he loves me that I wasn't rejected um and I just I can't there no there are no words I can use to describe to you how much I needed to know that. Yeah, that that turns the that turns on its head the stories we tell ourselves yeah. about relationship and yeah. you know I I'm reminded that in in one in one belief system I've heard that if it feels that bad to your soul it's not true. See, that's exactly what I came to realize that when I thought about like he he you know, he doesn't still think about me. He doesn't still love me. I thought that doesn't feel good. Therefore, that's not from God. Mm-hmm. This incredible joy that I can't even describe, mm-hmm. that's from God. Yeah. That's, oh, that gives me goosebumps. That's exactly yeah, and, what and, I can And I have, I have worked with that, with that thought for years because, okay, that resonates, but how can that possibly be true? If you're looking at, let's say, a, right. 3D, re- a 3D reality. Yes. And you think about that and that feels really bad. Well, because it's so uncomfortable, not just that it feels, but it's so uncomfortable to your spirit. It doesn't feel good. No. Then, that's then not it's not God. true. So if that's not true, what is true? And what is true is that regardless of where that relationship is in the world. We still love each other. Love always is. Yeah. Which is extraordinary. Yeah. I just got through reading uh, A Live Coal in the Sea by Madeline Lingle, and that's a book about um, to whom do I belong, you know, uh, who are my parents and grandparents and all that identity kind of stuff. And um, when the, the lead character's granddaughter was saying, well, you're not my grandmother then, and she said, well, that's a very... She she said, and in, and in, and in response to questions about other people's relationships, she said that's a very legal, thin way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. What matters is time and experience. So I am your grandmother. Yes. 
It's beautiful. Yeah. And so like, like you said, you know, not having words for it, uh, all I've been able to say to God is I'm overwhelmed with my love for you mm. because there's no, there are no words to describe. I've, I've found that love begets love that, that by God um, revealing this to me, It's it's almost like I don't I don't it's it's like I don't need to be told. Well, try to have faith. It's like okay, I've got faith. I know that I know what works now. I know that this works exactly. And um, that that love begets love. That as God gave me this gift, and I was filled. With, I'm filled with joy and love and all of that. My love for God has grown. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I, I would call that being aligned with truth. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly it it's it's just so clear. Yep. That yep. it's ir- irrefutable within yourself. Yeah. Yep. It's beautiful. It's funny you said that love begets love because I have a I I don't track this, I can't always remember, but I saw a quote the other day that said life begets life. Yeah, exactly. And I put it on my wall. Yep. You know, the more you are in tune with what is real and true and flowing and and eternal and yeah and love, mm-hmm. it can't help but create more of it. That's its nature. That's its nature. It yeah. yeah. That's who it is. <sighs> Katie, this has been a fabulous conversation. Thank you. I've Thank just you loved so much. it. I thank was, you so much for joining us. Thank today. you so much for having me. I, I told uh, son Mark a couple of days ago, I said, I just love Arlia so much. I, she and I are just connected at the soul. So we are. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Thank you for being here on the women's sanctuary with me. And thank yeah. you for your, thank you for being here in the world and your work and thank your you. gifts in the world. Thank you. You too. And for Katie and I, thank you so much for being here on the Women's Sanctuary, and we will see you again next time.